Our next speaker here, Trey Forgetti, is here to talk about the challenges of user privacy in a location-sensitive system like 911. Uh, he's part of the 911 Association. Uh, this talk is being recorded for to show it online later on, so if anyone has any questions, please walk down the, uh, to the microphone at the center aisle, and we can record the questions too. So without further ado, Trey. Thank you so much, and thank all of you for being here this afternoon. I know your time at DEF CON is precious. Um, and and I, I will say for my part, I very much want to make this talk uh, a lot less formal and a lot more um, interactive than some of the talks that you'll see in the other tracks. So if you have at some point a question about anything that I'm saying, please don't wait till the end, come up to the microphone. And as soon as I get to like a convenient pausing point, I will uh, take your question because uh, this is a really um, interesting area that I'm very passionate about. I'm being told I can't be heard, so let me, I'm just gonna hold this, how about that? Everybody hear me now? Good. So um, where we start is, I, I get a question all the time so you guys at 911, you're just tracking everybody all the time, right? That's how you know where I am. And the answer couldn't be further from the truth. Um, we are not tracking you at any time. In fact, you would almost be appalled at how little location data we do get when we want to find you, which is when you call 911. So my talk is gonna go over a little bit about what we do get, when we get it, um, how we are actually part of the privacy solution by virtue of keeping people who want access to location data away from it when they shouldn't have it, and how we uh, acquire and store and use location data when you make it available by calling 911. So um, at the outset, I think I want to start with just a quick thing about how location works. Are folks here familiar with how GPS works, like do generally? Okay, I'm gonna go into it just kind of at a very high level. So basically, uh, a few thousand miles up, we have a constellation of 30 odd satellites orbiting the Earth, uh, roughly every 90 minutes. And each one of them is singing a, a, a unique song, but they're singing it on the same frequency. And by singing the same song inside a receiver, essentially, you can find out how far off in time your song is from the one being sung by the satellite. And that tells you a time offset. So you get, and we multiply that by the speed of light, correct for things like the diffraction of the ionosphere that delays these signals. And then once we have ranging from multiple satellites, then your device can calculate it, its location in uh, 3D space. Now, it, it's pretty good horizontally. GPS, in the best of cases, can give us you know, five to 10 meter fixes most of the time. If you have a really good device with a great antenna and you know, a, a multi-band receiver and you leave it stationary for a very long time, you can get that down to like a tenth of a meter reliably or better. But for this typical case of something that's cheap enough to put in a smartphone and for us to carry around with us every day and you know, doesn't have a gigantic antenna sticking out the end of it, that's not the, really the reality. You're not gonna get anything nearly that close. So historically we've had this problem of we need to find people when they call 911, so how are we gonna do that? Well in the wireline world it was easy. We knew where the telephone company's wires went. They kept a, a, a billing database that said, you know, here's where our wires go. And when you established phone service, we could go to them and say, look, for every address that you put in your database, you have to validate that with somebody. It's something called the master street address guide for your locality, which is a table that contains all of the valid street names and all of the valid number ranges within those street names. And so they could submit that address, make sure that it was valid. If it wasn't, they had to go back to you and say, hey, it looks like your street doesn't exist or uh, potentially your number's out of the range, like what happened? Did somebody build something new? And if that's the case, okay, we gotta go fix the database. But there was a process. We knew where everything was. Smartphones aren't like that. They move around. Cell phones generally move around. And so we had to come up with ways to figure out uh, where mobile devices were. In the early days, there were two very general ways of doing this. There was called the network-based model and the handset-based model. In the network-based model, devices in the network either transmitted or received signals uh, to or from a device and used information like 
angle of arrival, time difference of arrival, or absolute timing offsets to calculate ranging and bearing data and figure out where the device was. And that worked. It's actually very fast. It's one of the fastest ways to find someone generally. The problem is it's not terribly precise. Um, with those sorts of methods, you can get within two to three hundred meters very quickly, but you'll never get down to some tens of meters. It just doesn't work that way. So that was the typical technology in CDMA, or excuse me, in um, GSM networks, because in GSM networks, that was what was convenient. They, they had the right sort of signal structure to do that kind of ranging. CDMA had, at the time, a really cool advantage, which is when I talked about the way GPS satellites sing little songs, they're actually doing that in a, a kind of a version of CDMA. It's, it's all the satellites transmit on the same frequency, but they do it with different uh, pseudo random number sequences imposed over that, and you can pick individual satellites out by knowing which one of those are. You're looking up in an almanac, okay, what satellites should I be able to see? getting that from the constellation itself even, and using that data to figure out, okay, what should I listen for? Since CDMA handsets already had correlators inside that could do that for the networks they were attached to, someone had the bright idea, well, let's just reuse that as a GPS receiver. And it worked. It worked brilliantly. Now, the trouble was, early on, there was only one because they only expected you to be carrying on one voice conversation at a time. So when, in the early days, they wanted to figure out where you were for 911 purposes, they actually had to say, hold on a second, you're going to hear silence while I determine your location. And then they would trigger, uh, the 911 the center would trigger something uh, in the carrier network to actually start that process with your device. The device would listen for the satellites, collect the data, correlate it, ship it off to the network. The network would calculate your position and relay it via a database to the 911 center. Really kludgy, and you don't want to tell somebody in the midst of an emergency, please hold, right? That's not a great thing to tell someone when they're like screaming to death. Um, so, so over time, we got better. We got better chips with more correlators. We got to the point that we could actually put GPS chips in almost every phone. And these days, that's what everybody does. We have GPS chips. Most of the network technologies have sort of gone away. We still have uh, two out there called Advanced Forward Link Trilateration which is a ranging technology uh, used mostly in CDMA networks, and then um, OTDOA, which stands for Observed Time Difference of Arrival. How many navigation nerds are there in the room who've heard of LORAN? Oh, okay, we got a, okay, a few people, good. So this is, this is the really cool thing. OTDOA is just LORAN with cell towers instead of LORAN chains. It's, you just listen for the time differences between transmissions of synchronized towers, and then you can use that to do hyperbolic ranging which is really fun. It's kind of a cool sort of thing. Again, it's one of these network technologies that are fast, but not necessarily super precise. All well and good, okay, fine, you've got a, me a measurement system. Um, what do we do with that now? In the 911 case, and I said this before, we're not tracking you. We don't want that stuff running all the time because frankly, we don't have anything to do with the data and it's really not of any interest to us. We need to know where you are when you have an emergency. Uh, you don't want that going on, obviously for privacy reasons, otherwise you wouldn't be in the crypto privacy village. And you also don't want it going on because it's a very battery intensive activity to keep track of yourself precisely all the time. In fact, most of the things that you see, you know, this question, why is it that Uber can find me but 911 can't, that we hear so often, I really hate this question because like most of the time, Uber is not, Uber doesn't, hasn't measured where you are to any degree of certainty. They have software in your, plat in your device platform and in their uh, platform that's making a very educated guess. People tend to focus on the little blue dot that tells you where the thing thinks you are. What they often don't realize is that there's also a blue circle around that. There's some uncertainty associated with that location fix. And often in the case of uh, commercial apps on smartphones, that uncertainty is actually relatively large. It can be on the order of hundreds or even thousands of meters. Um, that's calculated at uh, about a 90% confidence level most of the time, uh, which we want. We want about a, only about a 10% margin that will find you outside the circle. But if you think about a place like Caesar's Palace, an uncertainty of 100 meters or 200 meters makes it really difficult to find someone. It makes it really difficult to go search for them. 200 meters might put me in any one of three different hotel towers, the casino, the conference center, and a bunch of restaurants. So you really have to deal with constraining that uncertainty somehow 
uh, before you can use that for emergency response. Uber can make those you know, guesses because it has that ability to then ask you, okay, where are you in fact? Does this match up? And if not, drag the map and you know, pick the little dot. We don't have that luxury in 911. So I've said that we're not tracking you. Well, what are we doing? When you call 911, a few things happen. I, I've talked about some of the different methods that we've used. Um, we're starting to add things from the handset now. Historically, only stuff that was baked into the baseband or the network was really available for 911. But these days, we're actually doing a lot more than that. We're, this is bleeding edge stuff that's just starting to come into the devices. But we're starting to be able to use Wi-Fi and Bluetooth both to do sort of associative location to say, look, we know that Trey's Wi-Fi access point is at this particular address in this town because he's there all the time and he's associated with that and so on. So if, if, if the phone can see Trey's Wi-Fi access point, that's probably a location of association that, that we can use as a starting point for a search. It's kind of a probabilistic sort of thing. That's a very uncomfortable proposition for 911. We want things to be deterministic. We want to be able to say to the cops and firefighters in the field who really couldn't find their way out of the building without our help that uh, you know this is how you uh, th this is exactly where to go. But that's not realistic. That's just not the way the physics of, of measurement work. Um, and that's why you know the other thing that we're looking at Bluetooth beacons. You put Bluetooth low energy in a light bulb for lots of really great reasons. One of the things you can do with that is associate that um, UUID, that, that Bluetooth beacon ID, with that location in a database. Uh, we're working on something called the National Emergency Address Database, which will actually associate Wi-Fi Max and Bluetooth UUIDs with physical locations in the world. So that if, for example, there's a beacon in this particular ballroom, I can be localized, if I'm within you know, 10 to 30 meters of that, I can be localized very, very precisely with that. But of course, that takes getting a lot of beacons out in the world. Thank you, Internet of Things. That's going to be easy. But then it also it means we've got to track those things and make sure that if they move, we find out about it, that you know, there's some aging in the database to make sure as things get older, we trust them less to provide location and so on. So at call time, when you make a 911 call, a couple of things happen. First off, the, your platform, your, your phone platform, whether it's Android, iOS, Blackberry, Blackberry, whatever, completely overrides your location privacy settings. It says, look, you've made a 911 call. This is really important. Turn everything on. We need to find you. Uh, historically, that's only meant like the GPS chip and you know, not some of the other cool things that you have in there, like the accelerometers, gyroscopes, magnetometers, barometers, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, et cetera. But we're working to change that. We're actually working to get to the point where we can ingest data from all of those different things to create something called device-based hybrid. And this is where we, we you know, use, those, use, use things opportunistically where they make sense. So GNSS, GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, Compass Baidu, all of those things work phenomenally well outdoors in urban and suburban envir environments and even to some extent in sort of urban clusters, not necessarily in Manhattan and San Francisco and downtown Atlanta and Chicago. In those places, GPS is really, really awful. But Wi-Fi and Bluetooth things have much higher densities in those environments, and consequently, they are of more use. And so this is the concept behind device-based hybrid is we're going to opportunistically use what is best in the environment that it's in. So if you're in Manhattan and the best thing we have to like, figure out where you are is Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, we'll use that. And if not, if you're out someplace where GPS is working great, we'll use that. All of this is just, just sort of starting to happen. We've had uh, one company called Rapid SOS uh, that built some really cool stuff to kind of get location data around the database limitations of the legacy 911 network. And in doing that, they've kind of proven out that you can, you can get a lot more calls clustered down in that uh, you know, zero to 20 meter range with device-based hybrid. And, and I don't mean to like endorse Rapid or, or, or something like that. There are tons of folks working on this. Uh, Google just announced uh, a few months back that they're going to be doing a lot more uh, in their fused location provider for emergency services purposes over the next three or four years, um, including, and this I thought this was really cool, they're putting dual frequency GPS receivers in their devices, which allows you to directly measure and cancel the ionospheric diffraction uh, delay. And that is the primary source of error in a GPS fix. So in 
three to four years, your handset GPS locations, indoors and out, are going to be phenomenally better. They, they really will just get meaningfully better. We're also seeing barometers go into devices, which is really cool. These allow us to implicitly pull out a vertical location. If you have, oop, I've gone dead. If you happen to have, I think so. Hmm. That, oh, there we go. We're back. Um, if you happen to have uh, a barometer and you have a good external reference for what sea level pressure is, you can use those measurements, you can compare them and say, okay, I must be this much up or down from that reference datum. Now, in order to do this, you've got to have measurements that are fairly localized. And so, uh, you know, another example, this company, NextNav, their idea is to put sort of pseudo lights or fake GPS satellites on cell towers and buildings and broadcast basically their own GPS signal down at 900 megahertz where it penetrates deep uh, into buildings and to broadcast as part of that hyper local barometric pressure corrections that let them uh, pull up exactly uh, the height that you are at with, with a great deal of reliability. Now, what do we know about 900? 900 is the junk band, right? Everything awful is in there. It's completely useless other than wireless meter readers who just sit on top of everything except that the one thing that is actually privileged in 900 megahertz is multilateration and location monitoring services and there are licenses and these guys happen to have a lot of them. Um, there are other folks who have them for other markets but this is like a cool thing that you can do in the 900 megahertz band and you, you, get, you actually get interference protection uh, if you do this. So cool, no, another cool thing. When you make that 911 call, all of this stuff kicks on and starts saying, okay, now where are you? Initially, when your 911 call arrives at a 911 center, most likely we will not have good location data at the start of the call. What typically happens, and this was something called phase one and phase two, phase one location is what we get at the beginning of basically every wireless call, and it just tells us the at street address of the cell tower that you're attached to and it's the GPS coordinates of the tower. Again, this is not you, this is the tower. And it tells us the central bearing of the cell sector that's serving you. So if you look up at a cell tower, it's usually kind of triangular, it's got antennas on the, the vertices of the triangle. Each of those has a particular central bearing, it's serving about you know 60 to 120 degrees. And so by knowing that kind of general bearing and then asking you questions, hopefully we can figure out if you don't know where you are. The way all of that works is super kludgy. It actually happens because of a database process that got started in the 1980s built for the wireline world. And that's why before we can get your more precise location, we have to wait a period of time for a couple of processes to happen. So first of all, the device has to actually calculate a fix that is better than whatever it had from you know, the, the tower and so forth. Um, and then it has to communicate that back to the carrier network. The carrier network has to pass that to a database management system provider. They have to further process it and implant it into the database that ultimately uh, your local telephone company typically uh, maintains because it was the one that they maintained for that wire line process oh so long ago. Then, at that point, the 911 center system either automatically or manually can re-query the database and say, okay, is there anything better? And typically by the 15 to 25 second mark is when we'll start to see an improvement, something like a GPS fix that's within the, within the allowable error range. The carriers have location targets that they have to hit. Ultimately, those are going to get down to uh, 50 meters horizontally and some number vertically that we, we don't know exactly what it'll be yet, but we're working on that. Or a dispatchable address. And dispatchable address is the process I talked about before with, with the database piece of it. Now, the one sort of worrisome part about this is those values, those location values, we know they're very sensitive, those are actually transmitted in the clear. But they're transmitted in the clear only within sort of trusted carrier networks and then only on the network's control plane. So the location information never touches the user data plane until it actually gets down to the 911 center 
and it is received at the start or you know some number of seconds into your call. And then at that point, uh, we kind of we, we look at this as like a hot potato. We'll you we'll keep that store it as long as we have to to provide you with service and to keep the sort of records that 911 centers are legally obliged to keep uh, for whether it's for investigatory purposes or just because the legislature said we want everything to be kept for 90 days or 120 days. Some things may get archived if they look like they're going to be important down the line, but not necessarily everything. I mean, it, we, we typically want to get rid of non-critical 911 data that's not subject to a litigation hold as, as quickly as possible. We really just want to get that out of the system. This is where it gets a little interesting because obviously being in public safety, 911 is part of a lot of law enforcement responses. A lot of law enforcement responses start as a result of a 911 call. In fact, almost all of them do. And 911 is known for having location data. People in the law enforcement and fire and EMS communities know that when you call 911, we get your location data. And so people not unreasonably often make the assumption that, well, if I need that for some other purpose, the way I should be able to get that is by just going to my friendly neighborhood 911 outfit and saying, hey, help me out with some of that uh, good, good location data, right? And we get those requests all the time. Our members actually get uh, location data requests from law enforcement and fire and EMS often when there's no actual 911 call going. So I said earlier, 911 really is on the front line of protecting user privacy because often the thing we have to do is tell sometimes even the boss no because we get 911 data for a purpose we use it for a purpose and that's part of user trust in the 911 system is that we're not going to misuse that 911 location data the other reason that these things happen from time to time is we also have access to a process for exigent circumstances so if you've ever seen the movie the call with Halle Berry, I, so small aside, I got to meet Halle Berry. She is amazing in person. She is even more beautiful and like even more friendly and awesome and wonderful. And she really like took a lot of time and effort to get in the trenches with real 911 call takers and learn how they do what they do, which was really awesome and cool. Hopefully there will be a sequel. But in that movie, there was this uh, occasion where a, a, a young woman was kidnapped and thrown in a trunk. And she made a very, she was only able to make like a quick, discreet 911 call to say, you know, help, I'm, I'm in the trunk, right? When that happens, we've got to have some, prox some process to get some location data when you're not on a 911 call. Now, the challenge for us is, as I talked about before, all of the location privacy settings and all of those sensors and, and measurement systems are not on unless you're in a 911 call. So the moment you hang up, we lose the ability to, to query for updated location information. And at that point, the best we can do, and I realize this sounds insane in 2017, is fax, yes, fax, a form to the carrier that was serving that 911 call to say, we need the best location data you've got for this particular phone number. The turnaround time for that can be 15 to 45 minutes, they generally, they do take it very seriously. They try to get the uh, exigent circumstances requests processed as quickly as possible, but it is, it is still a process. Like it, it's not an automated kind of thing. It is a very manual process. And then what happens once the carriers, lawyers, and engineers have looked at the form and said, okay, yes, this is a valid exigent circumstances request. There really is an ongoing emergency with a threat to life or property, then then and only then can they start to do a little bit to help us. But again, you're not in a 911 call. They can't turn on all the sensors. Typically, the best we can do is we fall back to uh, that sort of phase one information. We can typically get, okay, what tower and sector is serving the device? So we get you know kind of a point and a bearing. And if we're really, really lucky, in some cases, they will also be able to give us a range estimate. So I talked before about you know, GPS and the way the ranges kind of cross over and you can get a location out of that. Another way you can develop a location fix is with a bearing and a range. So that's a, a line and an arc and wherever they cross, that's sort of generally where you are because again, our measurements are kind of fuzzy. That arc can be really wide, that line can be really thick. You get kind of an annular sector. But hey, that's still useful data. 
But again, it's not data that we're getting easily. It's something that's very, very protected. Um, and in the 911 case, when we do get that, again, that's a manual process. So there's no database to put that in. That's actually something that's done on a, you know, we're on the phone with AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile, somebody saying, okay, where are they now? Okay, has the location changed? Where are they now? And it's this very sort of iterative manual thing. And eventually, hopefully, you can work out, okay, it's a car that's going down, you know, I-40 or something like that, and say, let's go try to intercept whatever that is and, and, and find somebody. And then, of course, immediately after that exigent circumstance passes, that location data that was used for that purpose basically has to go away because it wasn't necessarily obtained with an investigative purpose for law enforcement purposes. So then you've got to start thinking about, okay, do we get a subpoena? Do we get a warrant? How do we actually acquire that location data in a way that can be used for some uh, criminal prosecute, prosecutorial purpose that's not you know, related to an immediate emergency response? So, so that's kind of the, the multiple phasic approach that you have within the 911 center. We have the sort of baseline case. Um, I, I, I weirdly, I often hear people say 112, which is the European emergency number, is is really part of the global emergency calling standard, and you should use that. And in a lot of places, using 112 might actually get you to a 911 center. Like it, it might. It won't always, but it might. And if it does, the challenge though is it won't turn on usually any of that cool location stuff. So don't dial 112 unless you're in Europe. Once that location process is over with, there is sort of a residual question of what do we do with the data? And, and I don't think we have a good answer right now because the, your average 911 center is not technically sophisticated enough to be uh, encrypting or hashing or, or doing things like that with those sorts of data. They kind of have to rely on whatever their system vendor makes available. And oftentimes that doesn't include robust uh, confidentiality and integrity mechanisms. But that is something we're working on. So the next piece of this that I want to talk about is how we will acquire and use location information in a next generation 911 environment. And basically the process still stays heavily dependent on what the device and the network knows, but now instead of dealing with legacy wireline databases from the late 70s, early 80s, we're going to take this into a more IP based realm. So in next generation 911, when you dial 911 from a phone, whether that's a voice call to 911 or a video call or even a text session, we're going to have real time text very soon. Or, or total conversation. If you have you know, different accessibility needs, you'll have the ability to communicate in all of those different ways simultaneously, which is really awesome if you have a hearing or speech disability. Um, at that point, you've got a couple of things that have to happen. First, the device needs to figure out what 911 system its call should go to. So it's going to query something in the access network providers network. And, and here I want to stop and, and define a couple of terms because Historically, when you bought phone service from the phone company, you were really buying two, diff two very different things, but it looked like the same thing because it was all you knew. When you bought voice service from the phone company, you were buying, first off, a, a transport network. So that's a a an access network that, that is capable of moving things around. But you were also buying an originating service, the ability to connect from one endpoint to another endpoint using some uh, you know, particular address. Today, networks don't have to do all of those things in an integrated way. I can buy my access network service from, for example, AT&T, and I can buy my voice originating service from Vonage, for example. We have to accommodate that in the 911 system. We have to be able to deal with the fact that your carrier is no longer just the phone company. It may be somebody else. Historically, we have not done a good job of that because we've just bolted stuff on to the 911 systems over the years and we haven't really integrated a lot of these new technologies into the way the system works. So your device goes to the access network provider. Well, okay, why? Well, the infrastructure provider, they know where their wires go. They know where their cell towers are. They're the ones who have the sort of intimate, real world, physical connection with you that can be used to start that process of localizing the call. So your device goes and queries their location information server. It gets back 
currently uh, actually location by value. It gets so, sort of your here generally. Um, although we're trying to be very careful about giving that to devices because you know we, we can see a, a state where you might have malware on the device and you don't necessarily want to disclose location to that. So we're working on some cryptographic stuff to try and keep that private as well to basically tokenize it so that then the device can pass either that location value or that token to something called an emergency services routing proxy. And the purpose there is for the proxy to say to a big thing called a forest guide, which is basically a hierarchical database structure that tells you here are where all the countries in the world, what are their boundaries within those, what are the states within those, what are the counties within those, what are the 911 center service areas, and oh by the way, you're there, great, you go to this 911 center, that's where your call should go. So this involves a lot of um, GIS processing. Uh, that's geospatial information system. I think I have a slide here that actually shows some of that. So we actually have a standard for geospatial information systems. Um, remember I talked about that, that old school way of, of doing the database of addresses where you have a list of street names, a table of street names, and a table of valid number ranges? That's all well and good if you only need to locate people in like row houses, but what if you have an apartment building? How do we know that a floor number is valid? How do we know that a room number is valid? And moreover, how do we decide where do all of those 911 calls within that thing go? For example, if I'm Caesar's Palace, I might have my own, I might be a limited municipality, I might have my own response center that can get you help faster. We might want to route all of the calls within Caesar's Palace to them instead. Disney World's a great example of that. They actually have the Reedy Creek Improvement District. There are like six Disney executives that have houses like on the property. They're the entire voting block for the whole city of Reedy Creek. And, and they actually have their own 911 center. It's, it's like a best practice place. Everybody loves to hold it up as like shiny and new and good place to go. But uh, you, you have to be able to track those things so that you can do change management, so that you can know when somebody puts up a new building, how do we add that to our addressing system? And then once you've consulted the forest guide, it'll give you an IP address for something called the border control function of the NG911 system, next generation 911 system, that actually serves that particular location. At that point, the routing proxy, whether it's in your access network provider's network or if it's disaggregated in the originating service provider's network, will actually send signaling and media to that border control function. And then my, to me, the coolest part of all this is if at some point, during the call, things change and there's some reason, your location changes or whatnot, and there's some reason to redirect the call either before the setup is complete or during the call, there's actually an intelligent mechanism to say, hey, there's this other 911 center that might need to be involved in this response. Do you telecommunicator handling the call want to loop them in? Even if it's on like a listen only basis, and you can do that. And you also get a, another kind of cool capability is you can have now specialized 911 centers that deal just with particular populations that have very specific needs. So for example, in Washington DC we have one of the largest universities for the deaf and hard of hearing, Gallaudet. Great school, they actually do a lot of cool engineering work related to 911 stuff, but if you have a 911 call that's coming from just the area of the Gallaudet campus, you might want to put that into a different queue for someone who has a hot connection with an ASL interpreter or knows ASL themselves and can handle that video call that way, or who's trained specially to handle real-time text calls. And that's something in today's environment we absolutely can't do because remember back, we're routing everything based on that cell tower and the sector. At the beginning of the call, that's all we know. In the future, the idea is we're going to route based on the actual X, Y, and hopefully Z someday from the device, and that makes it a lot easier to do much more granular things like that that can really help. I mean, it has a huge impact. If you're in a population that has a specific need like that, it's a really big deal to be able to get to, the, uh, get to something like that on the first try. Because today, one of, the, one of the terrible things that happens is if you need to connect with somebody uh, like a video interpreter, that can delay your 911 call on the order of 15 to 30 minutes. And that is not an amount of time you want to be waiting in an emergency. Um, I've used about 40 minutes here. I haven't had anybody volunteer questions, so I just want to level set. Are there things that I, I've covered in insufficient depth or not covered or other things you want to hear about?
so that I can kind of tune the, the rest of the talk. Yep. Oh, it's funny you think there's IP switching involved in this. That's, that's very quaint. Yeah, no, um, so, so the question was, uh, when I said that location data is transmitted in the clear, what part of the sort of transactional structure was I talking about? So from the device to the network, it is encrypted at the level of whatever the, the bearer established for that. So in LTE, um, it would be encrypted. In GSM, it would be encrypted probably weekly. Um, same thing in CDMA. Within the carrier network, it will be segregated, but not necessarily encrypted. And then the way it's, and I know this is why I laughed about the whole IP switching thing, the way it's actually transmitted um, within the telephone company networks is as a series of either medium frequency tones or maybe DTMF in some cases. Like the, the, it, it's really kind of hilarious how some of this stuff still actually works. The, the data block we get with a 911 call, I, I think I said this in my talk the other day, but it, it bears repeating, um, is 512 n maximum, 512 non-extended ASCII character set letters and digits. And, and that's all. So when you want to represent something uh, like a physical location, it, that's all you've got to work with. And, and so we, we've really had to like figure out, okay, how do we dumb this stuff down? One of the big things that we're looking forward to is once we have these next gen systems where we can protect it properly, encrypt it, and it is an IP system, is actually starting to be able to represent things graphically. I think I showed, here's an example of like an uncertainty around a floor, for example. Today we couldn't do that. We couldn't pull up a visualization of a building and put circles or ellipsoids or spheres or other things in there and say, look in this general area because we have no way of representing that um, in the 911 systems that we have. Now, the cool thing is the carrier standard that makes all of this work at kind of the numerical level is something called J standard 036. I think it's an ATIS slash TIA standard. It actually defines the ability to send different geometric shapes. So I can send an ellipsoid point with uncertainty. I can send a, a point with spherical uncertainty. I can start to do uh, you know, annular segment, things like that. Nobody does that because, again, we don't have any way to represent it today. So the question was, what percentage when it comes to dispatch is sent in the clear versus uh, encrypted or perhaps digital? I assume you mean, and I assume you mean the radio part. Yeah. Okay. So the radio part of dispatch, how much of it is encrypted, how much of it is in the clear? Overwhelmingly, it's in the clear. There are places that are starting to do more encrypted communications badly in most cases. Um, if you look, uh, Matt Blaze, Travis Goodspeed, and some folks did an analysis a few years back of one, like the, the dominant public safety radio standard in the US and found that it was basically hopelessly insecure. Um, they used a really weak, kind of even more broken version of RC4 as the, as the stream cipher uh, in some commercial implementations that were very cheap. And so everybody used those even though they weren't terribly interoperable and they're not at all secure. So we're in the process of trying to fix that. Earlier this year, the Department of Homeland Security and NIST worked together to get a, a requirement into the standard so that I think starting in 2018 going forward, all radios built to that standard will now have to have AES-256 as a mandatory uh, part of their cipher suite. They can still have broken versions of RC4, but AES-256 has to be in there as well. And part of the reason for that is in the public safety community, interoperability is a huge deal. Disasters may start local, but they usually don't stay local. And when they go beyond the, you know, disasters don't obey jurisdictional lines, no, ma no matter how much we admonish them. And so eventually you've got to have help from your neighbor. And when that happens, being able to talk with them is a big deal. The other thing, I, I appreciate that question about encryption. The other thing that I want to raise a serious point about, though, is um, authentication and integrity checking. Because even though we are fixing the encryption problem, 
sort of, we're getting to a standard. We are still not doing anything about protecting networks from, uh, radio networks from n bad devices, so devices that, aren't, that don't belong there. So most of the radio networks uh, today, if you know like an eight digit code, that is really easy to pull off the air. You, you can get a radio attached to that network and start receiving traffic from it. Um, it's not authenticated in any way. And then there are also vulnerabilities to replay attacks uh, in these networks, so you, you don't have uh, good integrity mechanisms either. So we, we know that's a problem. It's something we're working on. The, the trouble is these are tens of million dollar networks that turn over once every 15 to 20 years and the next iteration may just not happen because they're actually building an LTE network right now for, for first responders that's gonna be nationwide. So there's a big debate about, well, do we even like keep working on these standards because at some point we're just gonna use that because it'll be better. Not necessarily soon, but someday. Other questions? So the question was, when you make a 911 call, location stuff turns on, does the data that's developed as a result of that get stored on the phone in a way that it could be recovered by forensic analysis, the, the cops down the line or something? Um, I don't know a really good answer to that question. The, the challenge is there are so many parties involved because there are legal obligations and interests that the carriers have. There are very different legal obligations and interests that the handset manufacturer has, and even the uh, chipset manufacturer, the folks who are putting those measurement devices, how those interface with the 911 aspect of the device can vary. So I, I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. I, my hope would be that once the 911 call goes away, that that location data goes away as well, in part because in, in the 911 business, one of our big concerns is always, well, can we adequately protect the safety of someone who calls 911 but doesn't want a third party to know that they have. Um, one tactic that we see, particularly like in an abused spouse situation all the time, is somebody calling 911 and, and pretending to order pizza. And when they do that, most clever telecommunicators and dispatchers will say, you're telling me that you need to order a pizza because you wanted to call 911 and you don't want someone else to know, is that right? Yes, pepperoni. Which is, you know, so, and that's the kind of thing where we don't want somebody to be able to look at the device and say, oh, you called 911 from the house where you know you're not supposed to call anybody. Like, that, that would be a potential information disclosure that would not be good. There's a question right there. Yep. Could you come up to the mic so that we can get this on the recording? Uh, yeah. Hello? I don't know if this mic's actually on. Okay. Okay, uh, the question was, can the location information that is collected be used to prevent things like, for example, swatting? I promise I did not pay him to answer that, to ask that question, but that is like the best possible question you could ask. Um, it is something that we have been looking at for a very long time. The answer is yes, absolutely. It should be used that way every time. It, 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 I go through no end of amazement that people don't, uh, don't always check mismatches like that when there is a call. I do think it, one of the benefits of, frankly, having humans in the loop for 911 calls is that rather cleverly a lot of the time they do say that and you know, they'll, they'll say to somebody, look, before you go full SWAT on Brian Krebs again, maybe let's make sure that this call is actually coming from there. And the other thing that we've been able to train on is when you get a call from a non-service initialized device, so a cell phone that doesn't have service, which is required to still be able to make a 911 call, treat that as suspect until you have really, really good information linking it to, to that person's thing. Now part of the challenge is if you're too far away from the target of like a swatting attack in the first place, your call's not gonna go to the right 911 center anyway. And then you're gonna raise a whole host of other questions. Like, well, if, you're in Bo if your call ended up in Boca Raton, but you're calling from Denver, uh, 
then there's something, clearly something has happened that we, we don't expect and that we ought to be asking more questions about. So great, great question, really appreciate that. And in NG911, one of the things we're gonna do is a lot more data analytics capabilities to make sure we're authenticating things like that. In fact, as I talked about like the device-based hybrid and the national emergency address database and all that, when we were negotiating those new rules with the wireless carriers and the FCC, that was one of our key concerns was if they get a Wi-Fi hotspot, for example, out of the database and it says this hotspot is here, let's say Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, but the call came in from a cell tower that was in Knoxville, Tennessee, okay, you know, Houston, we have a problem, don't use that location data, fall back, use the tower, use the GPS, whatever else you've got. So location data that comes from the, ad, the database process has to be corroborated going forward. That, that was a big deal for us for like, from an integrity standpoint to make sure that we, we had corroboration. Yep, in the back. The question was, is there a 911 app? Let me be really clear. No, there is not a 911 app. If I could get Apple and Google to do one thing, it would be to just grep the entire App Store, the entire Play Store, and delete anything that involves the words 911. They don't work. They're totally bogus. There's all kinds of things, and, and I, I hate to be this, like, passionate and upset about it because I love that there are developers out there trying to do helpful things for people in an emergency. But the thing that, like, none of the developers, with maybe one exception, who have ever attacked this problem have understood is just how much legacy cruft there is that stands between anything you can do with an app and the 911 system. It just doesn't work. The only, uh, there's been one startup that sort of, kind of, halfway cracked the problem and they literally had to go and build millions of dollars of infrastructure. They built their own NG911 system to just do an end run around the whole thing and then ultimately find some carrier partner to trunk the calls out to PSAPs. It, it, no, there is no app that works with 911 and there won't be. There, there are very good reasons that you should not do that. Again, I appreciate people's passion, but like it, it just, it, it doesn't work, don't. Um, as, uh, unfortunately, there are dozens of apps on both of, both of the major platforms that purport to do something like co connect you directly to the nearest police officer. Well, okay, A, the app provider doesn't know where the nearest police officer is, and B, the only way to connect to that nearest police officer is over a radio platform that I guarantee you that app developer knows nothing about. And moreover, that police officer does not want your 911 call. Like, that's not the process. You know, they've got other stuff going on. You know, for the third of 911 calls that are like cat up a tree or McDonald's got my order wrong or, or you know, what, whatever the thing was that went wrong, the nearest cop, the nearest firefighter doesn't want that. We have these things centralized for a very good reason. The people that take these calls are an important part of the process and you can't circumvent that. So, sorry to be passionate about it, but yeah, no, no app and won't be. Down front? Just along those same lines, um, you said it's a large legacy system. Let's say someone released an Android malware that switched everyone's phone and downloaded the malware into 911 mode. Would the system be able to handle that kind of like extreme ramp up traffic if it all came at the same time? Clearly, you missed my talk yesterday. So that actually happened. It was uh, so the question was uh, if we have all this legacy stuff that's very susceptible and you know minimum traffic carrying capacity, what if somebody uh, has some malware that gets on a major platform and then starts calling 911 repeatedly? Uh, what I will do is point you to the DEF CON media server because once once that talk goes up, you can get uh, 45 minutes of a great answer to that question. Yeah, in the back. Yep, the question is, what about the integration with SS7? Um, the regrettable reality is SS7 is going to be with us for some period of time. For most 911 systems, SS7 would be an upgrade because they're still using MF and CAMA. Uh, yes, yes, you can ha that is exactly the look you should have when I say they're still using MF and CAMA, but they are. That's, it, that's how they're signaling things. They're not using SS7. Um, the ultimate goal is to bypass that completely. We'll still have to have SS7 interfaces for carrier networks that hang around um, because signaling system 7 is going to be with us 
for some period of time. But next generation 911 is designed to start getting rid of that, get it out of the system as quickly as we can. I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Anyone? Okay, I'll be hanging around in the hallway then. Thank you all very much for coming to the talk and great, uh, great getting to chat with you. Take care.